I have occasionally mentioned methods of detecting and sampling ornamental plant pests in our previous modules. In this module, I want to more formalize the methods that are recommended for detecting and monitoring the insects and mites that attack ornamental plants. There are many methods that can be used, and each landscape manager will eventually find what works best for them. I don't expect any manager to use all of the methods that will be described, but hopefully some will prove useful. There are numerous ways to detect insects and mites that occur in the landscape. Without a doubt, the best tools are your eyes and hands. Look for signs of insect and mite activity, and when it is seen, look closer to see if you can find the culprit. Of course, there are many tools that can make this process easier and more efficient. There are many types of sampling tools and traps that can be used. Learning what to look for and how to find pests is an important skill. We can discuss these in lectures and show you videos, but first-hand experience can't be beat. I highly recommend that landscape managers attend summer workshops and in-field seminars to learn from experts and fellow managers. Most seem very willing to share their knowledge and methods that are used to detect and identify plant pests. I don't expect every landscape manager to have a complete entomology collecting kit, but much of the collecting equipment can be useful from time to time. A sweep net can be used to sweep through the foliage of trees, shrubs, and flowers to pick up beetles, bugs, and moths that may be present. Pruners assist in taking leaf and branch samples, and a large hunting style knife can assist in digging around to find boars. An aspirator, or what I call a bug sucker, is useful for collecting small insects that may need to be looked at under a microscope for accurate identification. Entomologists also have killing bottles that are used to quickly kill insects so that they are not damaged. Collecting vials and plastic bags for samples are always useful. Leaf and needle inhabiting pests are most easily found using a beading sheet or tray. Commercially available ones are a round or square sheet of sturdy white cloth which is held open by a plastic or wooden frame. Simply hold this under the foliage to be inspected and strike the branches a couple of times with a stick. Most disturbed insects will drop onto the sheet. However, those that fly will take flight quickly, so you have to look and take several samples to ensure that you have made proper detections. When sampling for spider mites, I simply use a square foot piece of white foam board. Occasionally, I even use a tablet of paper held under plant foliage if I don't have a beading sheet or foam board. We discuss using yellow sticky cards in greenhouses to detect white flies and thrips. Yellow seems to be a very attractive color for many insects. Some set out yellow plastic pans that have water and a little detergent or an antifreeze solution in them. This is probably better used where extensive monitoring is needed. Other traps have been devised for specific insects. One for the emerald ash borer uses a large purple trap that has the sides coated with a sticky trap material and it used a vial of flower extract inside as an additional attractant. Again, most of these visual traps are not commonly used by landscape managers. Pheromone traps are quite useful, especially if one is dealing with clear wing borers or some of the pine tip moths. The most common traps are the delta wing trap and the little triangle traps. These can be placed out and baited with an appropriate pheromone. Many of the moth borers have males that emerge a week or more earlier before the females. So, when they appear in a pheromone trap, one has a few days to prepare treatments to target the females that soon emerge to mate and begin laying eggs. Light traps have been used for years by entomologists to monitor night flying insects. Many of the common moths that attack landscape plants can be detected using one of these traps. This can alert the landscape manager that soon after adult flight, the larvae will begin to appear on the landscape plants. One of the best tools that commercial landscape 
managers can use is landscape mapping. Creating a map of a customer's landscapes can be easily done by making a crude map or even downloading Earth satellite maps of customers' properties. Identifying key plants on this map can help the service technician locate plants that should receive more attention at the best times of the year. On this map, I've identified two key plants, roses and a weeping cherry tree. These always need extra care. When I talk to many landscape managers, I ask them what records do they keep? Most will readily state that they keep records of when they have treated and whether the customer is paid on time or not. Of course, most states require records to be kept of pesticide applications and businesses want to know if they are getting paid. Unfortunately, very few companies keep records of pests observed and whether their treatments were effective or not. Once you have a landscape map, it should be easy to write down which pests were observed, when the pests were detected, and whether the pests needed to be treated or not. Over time, this can help the technician to better anticipate pests and show up at the best time to treat those pests. Now I'm going to switch gears and discuss some methods that are being increasingly used to better time controls for many of our landscape pests. Since insects and mites develop according to the environmental conditions that they are exposed to, many methods have been developed to use temperature exposure as the driving force in insect and mite development. Exposure to temperatures can be converted into units called degree days. By recording the amount of heat energy that an organism has been exposed to, we can predict how much development that temperature drove. We'll discuss this in more detail. Another technique is to use visual indicators of biological activities. It appears that many plants develop at the same rates as many insects and mites. Thus, when a plant like common lilac is in full bloom, this is the same time that an insect like pine needle scale crawlers hatch. These associations are called phenological associations. If you plot daily temperatures, these usually follow a sine wave and form. The developmental threshold for a so-called cold-blooded organism, whether it be a plant, bacterium, or insect, is the temperature when their physiology becomes active. The higher a temperature goes above this threshold, the faster the organism develops. If you put this threshold level on the daily temperature graph, the area above the threshold should approximate the amount of development that the organism undertook. A crude way to measure the amount of development that an organism undergoes is the average method. Basically, one adds the lower temperature for the day to the high temperature and divide by two. That gives you the average temperature for that day. You then subtract a threshold, and this gives you the average amount of heat units that the organism was subjected to and was actively metabolizing. For each day, these heat units are added up, and that will give you the cumulative heat units or cumulative degree days. When the average is below the threshold, no degree days are accumulated for that day. Most models have a calendar start date that degree days should be accumulated. For most insects, that would be around March 1st. A sine wave shape is closer to the shape of daily temperature rises and falls. As you can see in this illustration, the sine waves are a very close fit. This model is also more efficient at capturing degree day units early in the season when only a small part of the day was above the threshold. If the average was used, no degree units are calculated. But when using the sine wave, that short time during the day that was above the threshold is added to the cumulative tally. Here's what a degree day chart may look like. This is a simple one taken from a fruit tree spray program. 
It indicates that the first eggs hatch at 200 degree day units and the second generation of eggs hatch at 1300 degree day units. Thus, treatment should be made at those two times in order to keep codling moths under control. More complicated models can be constructed as shown in this one for the European corn borer. This one actually shows when the different instars should be present in their proportion of the population. Here's a list of degree day targets for a variety of ornamental plant pests. This one was developed at Cornell after monitoring many different pests over several years. The minimum and maximum degree days are rough estimates of when egg hatch or other activity first begins and ends. Notice that many of the pests have two to three generations. If degree day targets have been developed for a pest, why should one use plant phenology? It appears that many landscape plants have the same lower threshold temperatures, so they develop at the same rates as many of the insects and mites. Second, for landscape managers, most are working in the landscape where it is easy to observe when the plants are setting out leaves, beginning to bloom, are in full bloom, or have finished bloom. If these plant visual clues can be associated with insect and mite events, plant phenology becomes a convenient tool to use to predict pest activity periods. Dr. Dan Herms was a tree and shrub entomologist that worked at the Ohio Agricultural Research and Development Center in Worcester, Ohio. He hypothesized that the sequence of visual plant events could be used to predict when insect and mite pest activity would occur. Once this was done, a phenological calendar could be used to schedule pest management timing. In 2005, Dr. Herms had accumulated seven years of observations on 75 plant species in the OARDC Seacrest Arboretum, as well as the activities of 45 arthropod pests of the ornamental plants. He concluded at that time that a phenological calendar was just as good and sometimes even better than degree day targets. He continued collecting data until he left the university in 2017. Here's a shortened version of the early season part of Dr. Herm's phenological sequence. You can see that the exact degree days between the plant events and insect or mite activities don't exactly match, but their sequence remains the same year after year. So if you were waiting to control pine needle scale, full bloom of common lilacs would be a good phenological indicator of when you should apply those treatments. The actual phenological calendar with calculated degree days is still located on an OARDC website. Unfortunately, this website is only for Ohio zip codes. But if you put in an Ohio zip code, you can get a look at the phenological sequence. The sequence of events has been shown to be quite consistent across most of northeastern North America. The site can be viewed as a listing or as color images of plant phenological and pest activities. You can use this to determine what you're seeing in the field with the plants and the insects. Researchers at Cornell University and with the Cornell Cooperative Extension Service have been keeping records of ornamental plant pest activities for years and they have developed a bulletin that lists the pests and the degree days of specific events. While this seems to work best in northeastern North America, the degree day targets can be useful in other areas.